there are these questions in astrophotography forums which come again and again and again. Now I have no illusions and I will not make these questions go away. But at least for once I take the 10 which I encounter the most and I cover them here in this video. Right after the trailer. Hey, this is View Into Space. I'm Sascha from Switzerland. So grüezi miteinander and thanks for watching my channel. So these questions come in no particular order, but I hope for each of you there's something which you always wondered and which I can answer. And the first one is, can I use individual SHO filters with my one-shot color camera? And here we definitely have to distinguish between can and should. The answer for can is yes, you can. Absolutely, there's nothing in your way. And if you put, for example, an H-alpha filter in front of your one-shot color camera, you will get an H-alpha picture out of it. Now the other question is, should you do it? And the answer here is absolutely not. Because your advantage of your one-shot color camera is that you can actually gather multiple spectra at the same time. And that's why we have the dual narrowband filter. And so you can collect at the same time H-alpha and O3 or O3 and S2 together and then split them apart if you want afterwards. But so it would be absolutely a waste of your camera on the photons if you would actually put a single emission filter in front of your camera. And to stay with one shot color cameras, another question often asked is, why are my one shot color images so green after stacking? And connected to that, what can I do to make the green go away? Now, first of all, why are these pictures so green? Let's think about the Bayer matrix, R, G, G, B, right? So we have one part red, one part blue and two part green. And that's actually the reason why they're so greenish. There's an overrepresentation of the green part in your stacked image. So now there's a few tips which are usually given how to get rid of the green. And most of these tips are not really good. Tip number one, use gradient removal for that. Please do not do that because you're not taking away a gradient, you're taking away real signal data. Second advice, use an unlinked auto screen transfer function, which obviously lets the issue go away. But as we know, the auto screen transfer function is only temporary. So it only shows you the picture in a way, but the data in the back is still the same. So what should you really do? And the answer is linear fit. Because with linear fit, we really equalize out R, G and B. And while this was kind of an effort in the past with the toolbox and the auto linear fit script. This is really a breeze. If you still don't have the toolbox, please have a look at my toolbox video where I explain a lot of cool scripts which are in there. And one of them is the auto linear fit. I will leave a link in the description below. Third question also connected to one shot color cameras, which light pollution filter should I buy? Now, first misconception, which I see a lot is dual narrowband filter are not light pollution filter. They're narrowband filters. So for example, should I use an L Pro or L Extreme? That's not a comparison. It's not either or depending on something. It's the question, do I want to shoot narrowband? Do I have a nebula? Or do I want to shoot a galaxy or a star cluster where I actually need the full spectra. It's different. So when we talk about real light pollution filters, which simply protect you from the light pollution, but leave the whole spectra there, which you need. Then I think the quad band filters are really what is state of the art. And there's really two at the market at the moment. One is the Optolong L quad, 
and the other is the Antlia quad band filter. Both of them give you presently the best result from a light pollution protection at the present time. I will leave the link to these two filters in the description below. When it comes to dual narrowband filter, all I want to say here is it depends on your bottle area. The higher your bottle number, the more narrow you have to go, be it with dual narrowband, be it also with individual emission filters when you're shooting mono. And if you want to know more about all of that, one of my Basecamp videos is about filters. There I go much more into detail. Link is also in the description below. The next question is, how do I stack the moon? And there is a common misconception that you shoot the moon with photos like you shoot nebulas and galaxies and so on. And the interesting part is that to get the best results of the moon, you're shooting it the same you would shoot planets by creating a video. And funny enough, about a year ago, in between some scheduled videos, I suddenly was shooting the moon like that with a video and I had a spontaneous idea to create a video for you about that. And in the meantime, this is the most watched video I ever produced. This was completely random, unintentional, but it's a huge success. And yes, I will also leave a link to this video in the description below, which shows you nicely and step by step how to shoot the moon. Next question, do I need to take darks? And that was in the last few months a big story when Queef came out a few months ago and told us you do not have to take darks anymore. And he reiterated that in a more detailed fashion in his latest video about calibration frames. So in short, it's very easy. If you have a modern cooled camera like the Sivo ASI 533, like the 2600 MC or MM, obviously the 6200, or the cooled 585. In all of these cases, if you dither, you do not have to take darks anymore. No darks, no dark flats, only bias and flats. And that's it. In any other case where you have a cooled camera, but the sensor has amp glow, or you have an uncooled camera, or you have a DSLR, in all of these cases, nothing changed, you still have to take darks. And that's in principle all you need to know. Next question, which DSLR is best for astrophotography? And this is my subjective answer to this question. And my answer is none. DSLRs, any consumer camera out there, is not made for astrophotography, full stop. That doesn't mean that you cannot shoot beautiful pictures with them. And if you're on a budget and you already have a DSLR at home, by all means use it. But the question in a sense, which one should I buy, is the wrong attempt. You shouldn't buy a DSLR if you do not already have one. You should buy a dedicated AstroCam. Why? First of all, the regular DSLRs have a near-infrared filter. And this near-infrared filter blocks a lot of the HA which means you will not get any decent results for any nebulas. Now you can go and for a lot of money scrub that away, but then you kind of destroy your DSLR, then you have to use filters to make regular photos. And the other disadvantages still remain. And that is, the sensor is not made for astrophotography. It will have amp glow, it will have a lot of noise, it's not cooled, which means even more noise. And in a lot of cases, you will not be able to transmit the picture as easy from the camera to a tool like the ASI Air or Nina, which means you cannot plate solve and, 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 and. So I would only recommend the DSLR if you already own it and if you're on a budget and you cannot afford to buy an additional dedicated astrophotography camera. Next question, connected to the budget. I really want to start into astrophotography and I have a budget of $500. What should I buy? And I see the advice where people say, forget about it, just wait another two years until you have a thousand or two thousand dollars. There's the people who try to recommend some cheap scopes and so on. But from my point of view, in such a situation, 
the smart scopes are the best way to go. A C star or a Dwarf 3, they are about in this range. They might cost a little bit more, but not much more. But I would say for this amount of money between $500 and $1,000, while they do not make miracles, they will give you the best bang for the buck. And I would encourage people who consider such a smart scope to go into Astrobin and to really see what pictures can be produced with these smart scopes. And then they know if they will be happy with it or not. Next question, can I sell my astrophotos? And the answer is no. There might be about two or three famous content creators who can actually sell some of their photos but this might then also be more that you want to have a photo from this specific content creator or you want to support them. But as a regular amateur, forget about it. There's way too many pictures out there and there's way too many people who have equipment we can never afford. So never ever start this hobby under the impression that you could ever sell these photos and make a profit out of it. Question number nine, is PixInsight worth it? As it costs about $300 and for the people entering this hobby, $300 is a lot. And then they hear that they also need the exterminators, which are another $200. So we are at $500. So do we really should spend so much money and I think people who know me will know my answer to that question and it is absolutely yes. The main reason is, first of all, there is nothing better. That's just a fact and I think nobody disputes that. But what about the complexity? Wouldn't it be better to start with something easier? Well, even serial is not that easy. So if you start with something a little bit easier, you still have to invest a lot of time to understand this application. And then there will be a point where you still will feel that you have to step up and go to Pixie Inside. And then you have to learn the whole thing again, which from my point of view is a waste of time. Pixie Inside is not easy, agreed, but it is absolutely possible to learn it. You do not need a PhD for that. And I personally have a great entry tutorial called PixInsight as easy as one, two, three. And I get a lot of responses that people have no issue learning PixInsight with it. I'll leave the link also in the description below. And with that, we come to the last question. And here I also have a very big ask for you. The last question is, I'm a complete newbie. How can I learn astrophotography? This question I encounter about two to five times per day on Facebook forums. And as some of you might know, I started this summer with a 15 part series called Astrophotography Basecamp. It covers everything from the whole equipment that you need to the whole process of shooting, stacking, processing and publishing. There's a playlist which contains all of these videos. I will leave the link to this playlist in the description below. And here comes my big ask. If you encounter these questions in forums, please make them aware of this course and provide the link for this playlist. What I heard so far is that people feel it's really very helpful and I cannot be every moment on Facebook and in other forums. Please also, if you are a member of an astronomy or astrophotography association, make sure that your members and especially the members who enter these hobbies get knowledge about this training. I invested a lot of time creating it and I would really hope that as many people as possible can benefit from it. Thanks a lot. And with that, see you next time and clear skies.